Okay, so hello. I'm very happy to be here and to talk to you about a very dear topic to me, integrating sustainability in product design. But before going into the topic, I would like you to reflect, to think about your emotion in relation to sustainability in product design. How do you feel about it? Are you curious? Are you maybe intrigued? Are you concerned? Maybe hopeful? Or are you ambitious? Or maybe empowered? Maybe collaborative or innovative? Maybe you're resilient or reflective, adaptive or engaged or something else, something completely different. So if we look at the emotions that you have reflected on and on the stage at the stages that you looked at those can be somehow relatable for example when we are talking about the first stage of your journey to sustainability awareness and assessment we might say that mostly we feel curious and intrigued and concerned and hopeful then when we are setting up for we are setting up our strategy and the plan for implementation. Probably we feel more ambitious, empowered, collaborative, and innovative. And when we are already in monitoring and continuous improvement, probably we are more on the resilient side. We are reflecting, we are adapting, and we are engaged. One last question. So, so far, we have talked about sustainability in product design, but I'm curious to have the bigger context. Like, where do you see your organization in terms of sustainability? Like overall, not only product design. Is it more like an embryo, like a baby, like a child, like a teenager, like an adult, or like a senior? And those stages, we can actually relate them to the stages that we have talked about. Like embryo could correspond to awareness, assessment could correspond to a baby state, and then strategy could correspond to baby and implementation to the teenager and the monitoring to the adult stage and then improving to the senior stage. So let's dive in. What are the objectives of my talk today? I would like to give you the space to use one tool to measure a website footprint, then to get inspired by one practical strategy for positive impact, and to practice one technique to advocate for sustainability. Why? I think we are all on the same page because you joined this talk, so you probably agree that we are producing an enormous amount of waste and we are producing record high CO2 emissions. And this is seen actually this year in the temperature of the North Atlantic for three consecutive months. They have re registered the highest temperatures since they started recording the, te the ocean temperature. And we can see that in how Norway looks like. This was 100 years ago, and this was 100 years later, today. So looking at this, we should all design for sustainability, with sustainability in mind. And that would mean that we should build an experience. We should strive to build an experience that takes minimum of resources, creates minimum of waste and considers the well-being of people, of the society, and of nature. We go back to the stages that we have talked about. The first one was awareness. How is the digital space contributing? How are digital products contributing to the climate crisis? And some say it's not actually a climate crisis, it's actually a humanity crisis because Earth will be still here, nature will be still here, even if we are not. And many researchers have started to look into the digital products and see how much emissions they are generating, how much consumption they, they entail. And for example, for downloading one gigabyte of information, that would be roughly a movie, we generate seven kilograms of CO2. And you would say, that's not too much, but the 
key is the context, because take into consideration there are 5 billion people on internet today, and this number is growing every year. And also, people are spending a lot of time on the internet. Some say it's an average of seven hours per day, with Denmark having the least amount of hours, and I think Indonesia had the highest amount of hours. Then, Let's say we have a company with 10 computers, 10 people, 10 computers. And when they go home, they leave them idle. There is a LED on for the screen, for the computer. And that mean, means that on a year for those 10 idle desktop computers, we generate 33 kilograms of CO2. That, that, that's not computers that we are using, that's computers that are in standby. And then multiply by how many computers we have now, or maybe desktop computers we have now in the world. Let's talk about laptops. One laptop that is on for eight hours a day generates roughly 44 to 88 kilograms of CO2 per year. And that's a laptop that is not really used. I'm not watching Netflix or playing a game. I'm the laptop is just on. And now a question that I hope you can answer in the, in the chat. How much, since we are on a video call in a meeting online, how much do you think you can reduce your CO2 free foot, footprint when joining an online meeting without video? I see 80, 90, 60, 45, 30. 30, okay. So according to a research carried out in 2021 by MIT, 96%, you can save 96% of the CO2 if you turn off your camera. So you shouldn't feel bad <laughs> from now on when you don't feel like turning on your camera. You have a very, very good reason. And this can and tell you that actually video consumes a lot of energy. And if you look at the carbon footprint for Netflix, for example, or for other streaming uh, applications, then you will see that they have a huge footprint just because it's streaming video. One more question. What percentage of the global emissions come from internet? What do you think? So according to the research carried out last year, it's roughly 4%. And to give you a perspective, it's actually more than the commercial airline industry. And we are talking so much about the carbon emissions from the airline industry, while internet has roughly the same. If we don't do anything, the estimation is that in 2040, the increase in emissions, carbon emissions from the internet will be, so the increase will be 250%. If right now it's 4%, in 2040, it will end up being 14% of the total CO2 emissions. Where do these emissions come from? Some of them come from hardware. We need laptops and smartphones and all kinds of devices to have internet. Then another part comes from data centers. Another part comes from the network use. Remember transferring one gigabyte of data. And a huge part comes from consumer device use. And if we talk about consumer device use, we have smartphones, tablets, laptops, desktop computers, TVs, and now 3D glasses from Apple. So adding some stuff every now and then. <laughs> from those devices that you see on the slide, which one do you think has the highest consumption of energy? In the chat? We are doomed, I hope not. 
that's why I'm talking so that <laughs> you can talk to others. I see desktop, desktop. Okay. Hmm. Nobody picked the TV. <laughs> Actually, in terms of consumption, TV will consume a lot more than a laptop. A desktop will consume more than a laptop. And the device that has the least consumption is the smartphone. <laughs> so if the common perception is that we should design for mobile because we are centered on our users, actually we should design for mobiles because this has the least consumption. And if we are looking at smartphones, when using a smartphone, most of the energy, most of the energy from the battery goes to the main processor, the CPU. A big chunk also goes to the graphic processing. And you saw the statistic about the video turning on and off. And some energy goes to the networking chips, Wi-Fi and cellular, and also some to the screen how long is on and the brightness. But when we talk about the, the impact of pro digital products, it's not only energy, there are other resources that are impacted. And one is water. So according to MIT, streaming for remote work in 2021, uh, during pandemic needed 300,000 Olympic sized swimming pools of water for the data centers. And then put that in the context of areas that are confronted with drought, and then you get a more stressed picture. And the last point here has to do with the impact on people and on society the impact that the internet and specifically social media has in terms of misinformation, harassment, polarization, negativity, addiction. And speaking of addictive, addictiveness, in 2019, the inventor of the endless online scrolling said he's sorry for his invention because it's getting people addictive. And actually, in one of the user tests that I've done, I've noticed the same preference for scrolling. Users said that they prefer to see the information under scroll and not under tabs. But here, we should think about how to put some stops to the end of scroll scrolling. So that was the stage about awareness. The second step here has to do with assessment. How is the digital space impacting the environment and the people? And in terms of, in relation to websites, there are lots of tools now. Website Carbon is one of them. How many do you know it? So what we will do now is I invite all of you to go to the to Website Carbon. And there we will test a website, actually two websites. We will test organicbasics.com. What do you get? Everybody should get the same. It's not chat GPT. 55%. <laughs> and the second one is low impact organic basics. Have a look at the website and then see what the website Carbon says about it. 89 this time. Why? Why did you, what did you notice being different between the two websites? It's actually the same, is organic basics. One is low impact and the other one is just normal. Less pictures and animation. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that we, we notice less intense on graphics, pictures, and colors. Color, color is different, yes. So websites, the most energy 
that they consume goes to playing videos and we already know this then a lot of energy goes to displaying high resolution images and you saw the difference between the two websites also a lot of energy goes to performing animations and interactions to tracking and to scripts from third party tools also to hungry programming languages or big bundles of javascript and some other technical elements i have a very interesting article that i will share with you at the end so those elements will make your website if you pay attention to them you will make your website less carbon intensive what's interesting about this website is that at many of the talks that i have been at organic basics was given as the best practice example you can see on the slide the how the website looked like in 2022 and at that point you could see you can find the link to the low carbon website in the about section today when i checked the website had the complete redesign and it's not there anymore i'm not sure why but i will reach out to them to understand what's the reason so things are not here that straight when talking about sustainability coming back to tools right now there are lots of tools out there especially for websites and i heard that they are working also on tools to evaluate the the, the emissions or the energy consumption of applications but speaking of websites beacon echo grader website grader are three other tools i will paste the the links in the chat i encourage you to go check all of them actually echo grader has been updated this year and has a very wide section on what should be improved in a website what works well and what needs more attention so we go to the next step which is strategy coming up with the strategy how can we make the digital space our digital products be more sustainable and here i invite you again to reflect on your own every day think about the everyday task that you have think about your colleagues think about the organization that you are part of so have the context and with this context in mind what question can you ask to start the conversation about sustainability of the digital product in terms of a strategy how do we go about to have a strategy in relation to sustainability when talking about product design? And for this, we can look at three big areas where we can look for improvements. One is related to everyday activities, related to working on digital products. For example, how do we communicate? How many Zoom calls do we have? Are we allowed to, is it okay for us to cut the video? Food, how much waste do we generate when we order food in terms of packaging? Business travel, do we have a policy to travel by train if there are under nine hours of travel time? Office energy consumption, do we turn off the light in the bathroom? So these are all elements mostly connected to HR. From HR, we usually we have the procedures and how things are organized and they set the tone for the culture that should support sustainability. But nevertheless, we are working on a digital product and this has an impact too. Another big part has to do with design processes. So what strategy should we have in terms of having research more sustainable, doing research in a more sustainable way, or doing synthesis in a more sustainable way, 
or creating visuals that are more sustainable or communicating to devs, handing off our design to in a more sustainable way. And the last part has to do with the digital product itself. How much resources uh, are consumed, how much energy it draws, how much waste is generated, what's the impact it has on people, on society. And I put a special part, let's say a special category for content, because we are creating a lot of content and we not we are not having necessarily a strategy how to deal with the content how how do we go about it when it's old for example we are not going to talk about each of these areas but we are going to touch only on a few of them and looking at everyday activities something that has to do with our work as designers, for example, is how the printable documents look like. Should we have big chunks of color on papers that we print? Like the two examples there, a ticket from Ryanair and the ticket from an event? Or should we stretch some information on 15 pages when we can easily have the same in five? So these are decisions or these are ideas that we should have in mind when designing or when preparing these documents that are going to be printed. And speaking about the design process and the research, how important are the questions you ask when you do research for your product? Important, very important, because we are doing research so the questions are important. This is what show us what the users, what problems they have, what are their pain points and their needs. But maybe the next research or the next story will put questions in a different light. In the 90s, two researchers for two universities in US asked 40,000 people a question about the strength of their desire to purchase a new car. And in the following six months, the actual rates of car purchase among the group were 35% above the average. So just by asking one question, the researchers were able to influence or to put an idea in the heads of the people. And this is referred to as Schrodinger's car, or the mere measurement effect. Simply by measuring the state, researchers changed it. And now I invite you to go back to the question that you th thought about earlier, to understand the importance of that question. Asking not only supervisors, yes, it's important to have allies but also the users have you ever considered asking the users what they want what impact what negative impact they perceived from the product time is running short so we go to the last <laughs> part that has to do with monitoring how can we advocate for sustainable digital products and i say Use numbers because and use numbers to show impact to users and to give options to users. And here I present to you two examples. For example, for example <laughs> I show you, you know, after purchasing a ticket by train, I was able to see how much CO2 I saved by comparison to car. So you should show the impact. You should make visible the savings of CO2, for example. Make the impact, the positive impact visible. Also give options. For, with, on the website of Lufthansa, you can fly CO2 neutral. So you give the options of lowering CO2 emissions. Here we can go into a different discussion. How much is 
claiming and how much is real, but hopefully with the EU Green Claims Directive, this will be sorted out and companies, organization products won't be able to just put a label echo and say, yeah, we are doing, but actually there is nothing to support it. So hopefully you are going on the, uh, on the right way there. And very important, look for allies. And this is valid for the whole process, not only for monitoring. And looking for allies means measuring the impact on business. For example, get your guide looked at how to tours eco certified perform by comparison to just normal tours and they noticed that the revenue the net revenue generated was in 2021 was 291 percent higher and with these numbers you can get support you can get allies and i put another example here it's not probably directly connected to sustainability, but I found it interesting. In 2017, Netflix decided to go from a five-star rating to a three-thumbs rating. And the, the motivation had to do with the user because the five-star rating wasn't properly understood. But also think about the data, like having five stars and having to sort so many data points means less data. And when you go for simpler choices, then you, you will have in the end less data to store. So my takeaway for today, I hope you have at least one tool to measure a website footprint and you know how to use it. I hope you were able to spot in between the lines one practical strategy for positive impact and one technique to advocate for sustainability. And remember, this is how doing nothing at all looks like versus making small consistent efforts. Not last, credits for the template from Slides Carnival and pot pot photographs from Unsplash. And that was it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that talk. We have some questions in the chat and feel free for people, if you still have questions, put them in the Metameter or upvote other ones. But there, one of the questions is, what are some like biggest challenges that you've seen people trying to implement these principles? Oh, so last year I've been to a UX camp and I remember like the biggest impact was a presentation on designing a sustainable website and they showed what was the approach and how they came up with the idea. And in the end, they actually said that the, the customer didn't choose that website, but went for a website that had full blown pictures and everything, all the animations and yeah. So I was a bit, yeah, I could say disappointed or puzzled how to go about it when customers don't, are not aware of the biggest impact, but, but then the argument that we can put forward has to do with the speed of the website, because when you have lots of videos and lots of elements, the speed might be low and that will create bouncing rates. So if we reframe the sustainability idea with costs and reaching business objectives, then I hope we have better a better case. Yeah, I think it also that that sparked for me when you were asking about like who you ask these questions to about sustainability and the fact of just asking and getting the users in that conversation, I think can kind of help with that challenge or that fight of like, this is something that our user groups want, or this is something that they value as well. And something that I remember in the doc, in the Google sheet that we worked, so there is a sheet number two, where you have some resources. If you want to do a course mm -hmm. on grid software design, there are two, two that I found. 
if you want some tools in relation to sustainability in product man in product design some communities and also some uh, articles wonderful yeah i see that now in the doc that's great it's a nice hidden surprise i guess let's say in the, in the... <laughs> there's actually two questions in the chat about do you have do you know of or are there any studies about like the environmental impact of working from home versus going into the office so i think we all kind of know the answer because when everybody was home and there was no transportation and no yeah no <laughs> other extra activities mm -hmm. then the co2 emissions in 2020, I think it was, they dropped by 4%. I have to check the numbers, but definitely they were less in that year. So in terms of sustainability and how much CO2 we are producing, there was less in that year. In terms of, um, let's say, mental health and relationships, here the conversation is a bit more nuanced because it depends on people to some degree. Some need to be surrounded by colleagues and they thrive in this kind of environment where others need more quiet space. So they are not so much impacted when working for longer periods from home. But yeah, here it depends. Yeah. Also, are there any go-to like companies that you feel are currently really like leading in the sustainability space? This is also a question from... The group but anyone that like you can kind of like shine a light on of somebody who's like doing it really well so as i said or um, organic basics mm -hmm. was one of them i'm not sure what happened with the um, website that is not so much visible uh, at this point I know Patagonia is a very good example I don't know so many examples in relation to digital products have you looked at uh, Tomorrow Bank? Which one? Tomorrow, Tomorrow Bank? Bank? No, I haven't read about them. <laughs> yeah, they the, in their core values and in their kind of, they're a new digital bank. And it's interesting of looking how they're like showing the emissions that you're saving and what you're doing in like the transactions that you do on the bank as well. And so yeah, I would, I would suggest people taking a look at that one as well. I think it's really cool. We just have one more minute, so I'm going to wrap things up. But thank you so much. This was such a lovely presentation. If you'd like to be more involved with the Guild of Working Designers outside of just our monthly meetups, we have a monthly book club. We have a lovely Slack group where you can get a lot of answers to your questions. Please just apply. It's the bit.ly link, Guild of Working Designers, or you can use this code up above. But... Thank you so much, everyone. As a reminder, here at the Fountain Institute, our vision is a world that seeks designers for the way that they think, not just what they produce. But other than that, that's all. We'll see you guys next month. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thanks.